So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our virtual lunchtime lecture, The Conception of the Erie Canal. I'm Rebecca McLean from the Oneida County History Center here in Utica, and we are very grateful to welcome Derek Pratt from the Erie Canal Museum in Syracuse today, who will be our presenter. Um, so I'll pass it along to Derek. Enjoy. You can do questions in the chat box, and we'll certainly take questions at the end. Uh, thank you. Great. All right. Thanks, Rebecca. And uh, hi, folks. As she said, I'm Derek Pratt. I'm the educator at the Erie Canal Museum. That's the one in downtown Syracuse. Just so you don't get confused, there are a lot of Erie Canal Museums uh, out there. Um, thanks for joining us again. And uh, today we're going to look at uh, sort of the idea or how the idea of the Erie Canal which was constructed between 1817 and 1825 and was considered at the time to be pretty much the eighth wonder of the world, uh, how that idea came to be. And we'll look real deep at the political wrangling that it took um, to get it built and almost kept it from being built. So let's begin. Um, okay, first uh, we'll look briefly at what the Erie Canal actually did. Uh, as the first large scale canal project in America, the Erie Canal totally transformed uh, both the young nation and New York State. Uh, it's after the canal was built as it funneled almost all of the trade from the upper Great Lakes. Uh, so this is the Erie Canal here, in case you missed that. Uh, and uh, as the name implies, went to Lake Erie. So all the trade from these four Great Lakes went down it. Eventually another canal is going to be made connecting Lake Ontario. And it's all going to get funneled right here to New York City. Um, and it's really after this is created, the Erie Canal, that they're going to actually start calling New York the Empire State. Um, that's because New York became the economic powerhouse of the country, thanks largely to this revolutionary transportation system. Uh, you can see on this map that states throughout the nation attempted to follow New York's lead and constructed thousands of miles of canal, though none would be as successful as the Erie was. Uh, of course, many of them, specifically these ones, would all help feed the Erie's success um, and uh, the growth of their regions, even if they weren't profitable for their states. Um, so uh, as the impetus for this transformative national transportation network, uh, we need to ask a few questions. One, why was the Erie Canal built in the first place? And two, how did the state of New York end up getting to a point where it could construct this audacious public work? Or how did the Erie Canal come to be get, come to be built? Well, these seem like easy answers, but they're not exactly. Um, to answer these questions, we need to go back about 480 million years uh, when the North American and African tectonic plates started to collide. Uh, that went on for about 250 million years, and as it occurred, a great volcanic mountain range, very similar to the Himalayas and Andes today, formed on what would eventually become the east coast of America. These mountains are, of course, the Appalachian Mountains, right here, um, spanning all the way from Georgia up into Canada. So that was 200, 250 million years ago. So 200 million years of erosion have made these lofty peaks into the much less awe-inspiring, if you will, uh, mountains, though still beautiful mountains that we know today. Um, so anyway, while these mountains are much shorter than they were historically, uh, they presented an almost insurmountable barrier to early Euro-American settlers, essentially trapping them on the East Coast where there was an abundance of natural waterways and plenty of relatively level ground uh, to easily move about on. These early settlers did realize, however, that the continent's interior 
held untold riches in timber, minerals, and fertile farmland, and they wanted to get to them. Uh, Daniel Boone would, of course, make the Cumberland Gap down here. Very famous in these early attempts to overcome the Appalachians, but one place that everyone realized they really need to focus on was right up here, the Mohawk River Valley. Uh, as I was discussing before this all started, you might also notice there's a notable gap right here through the mountains. That's the Champlain Valley and ultimately the Hudson, which was another early route, but we're going to look more at the Mohawk because we're talking about the Erie Canal today, not the Champlain Canal. Uh, anyway, uh, to answer, um, but how did, how did the Mohawk get there? Uh, here's a nice view of an early map of the Americas. We can see the Mohawk River right here. Uh, well, to answer the question of how the Mohawk showed up, uh, we're going to go a lot closer to the present than we were when we were discussing the formation of the Appalachians, to about 12,000 years ago when the last ice age ended. Uh, the glaciers of the Laurentide ice shelf had extended all the way into Pennsylvania and scoured the earth, forming well-known features in New York geography, like the Finger Lakes. But as they began to recede, um, these large lakes, which are known as proglacial lakes, started to form next to them. Eventually, one of these lakes would form around northern New York. Uh, this is known as Great Lake Iroquois. And this lake is the ancestor of Lake Ontario and Oneida Lake, uh, and the swamps that checker most of the middle of New York State. So if you want to imagine it, uh, Lake Iroquois extended all the way pretty much to here. It was a gigantic lake. And then apparently uh, the other four Great Lakes were also formed at this time. They were one gigantic lake, I believe called Lake Algonquin, uh, which ultimately carved out the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, so they were draining to two different spots. Um, and drainage is where we come to. Uh, so the difference between Lake Iroquois and Lake Ontario, besides their size, was that Lake Iroquois was unable to drain as Lake Ontario does out of the St. Lawrence River. Instead, it had to burst through the Appalachian Mountains, forming this, the Mohawk River. There was also a giant lake where Lake Champlain is, which Lake George is also an ancient remnant of. Uh, so all of them, they burst through the mountains here, they gradually eroded that, and converge in the Hudson River Valley, creating that. Um, so they carved out pretty much a giant canyon, which is today the Mohawk River Valley. Uh, and eventually the glaciers would recede further, the St. Lawrence would clear out, and we'd end up with the present waterways we're familiar with in New York. Uh, leaving the Mohawk River, it's today a minor stream compared to what it once would have been when Lake Iroquois was draining out of it. Um, yeah. Okay, so that pretty much brings us up to modern history, uh, if you will, relatively close. Uh, the Mohawk has been recognized pretty much since the beginning of human settlement in New York as an ideal way to bypass the Appalachians, and it was used extensively by Native American populations long before Europeans arrived. Uh, the first time Europeans arrived, though, at the Mohawk River, it's uh, in 1634 when a Dutchman named Harman Meinderns van den Bulgert, that's a fun one to say, uh, became the first European to navigate the Mohawk. And uh, Dutch colonists quickly recognized the use of the Mohawk for trade. Uh, the general route that the Native Americans and early settlers used was essentially this. Uh, you would take your boats up the Hudson River from first New Amsterdam and then New York uh, here to Albany. Right around here, there are the Great Falls at Cohoes, which are pretty much impossible to navigate um, and very difficult to get around. So you would have to carry all of your goods overland to Schenectady. 
this is really why Schenectady becomes a city uh, or an important town um, because you couldn't travel this part of the Mohawk. Uh, then from Schenectady, you take your boat up the Mohawk River and we see here Fort Plain, Little Falls, German Flats. Each one of those has their own set of waterfalls or rapids um, and you couldn't take your boat over those. Obviously you can't take a boat up a waterfall. Uh, so for all of those you'd have to unload your boat, carry all your goods around the falls, and then also you then have to pull your boat out of the water. Uh, not particularly fun, uh, but you could take your boat all the way up here to what on this map is called Fort Williams, which is essentially Fort Stanwix in Rome, New York. Uh, that was when you had the Great Cary. And that's why there's these two forts right here. Fort Williams, eventually you become Fort Stanwix, and Fort Bull on what's known as Wood Creek. This tiny little creek that meanders into Oneida Lake. Um, so the Great Cary is about a mile long and uh, you had to carry your boat and goods that whole mile. So it was a crucial choke point. That's why forts are built in this area pretty much from the get-go. But anyway, you could take your boat down Wood Creek, take it into Oneida Lake, and you could hook up with the Oneida River, and then head up the Oswego to Lake Ontario, or this map doesn't really show it. Over here is Seneca River, which will take you to all of the Finger Lakes. Um, as I mentioned before, there's also this alternate route. You can go up the Hudson River further. You have to get around out around here, carry your boats and goods over to Lake George. You can then do that, then over to Fort Ticonderoga and Lake Champlain. Uh, so that was that was the route. Uh, it worked. But as you can tell, it did not work uh, great. Obviously having to carry your goods and boats around was not a particularly easy thing to do. Uh, you had to therefore limit the size of your boats. Um, they had what were known as bateau and then eventually Durham boats, which are relatively small. You could carry maybe 20 to 30 tons of goods on those, but then you have to carry those 20 to 30 tons and the boat around numerous obstacles. So it's not, not great. And this system couldn't support anything more than a trickle of trade. Uh, so with that said, let's look at some of the early attempts to have something done to improve this route. Uh, the first person we'll look at in this long story is this guy, uh, Cadwallader Colbin who is often called the grandfather of the Erie Canal. In 1724, Colden, who was born in Ireland, was the surveyor general for the colony of New York. And that year, he was sent to explore the western regions of the colony. That technically extended all the way to the Pacific Ocean. British kings were not uh, they weren't afraid to, you know, make wild claims that they couldn't really do anything about. Uh, Colton didn't make it that far, though. He only gets to about Lake Michigan. Um, but on his findings, uh, he writes up a report in 1724, and he sends it back to the British authorities on, uh, on all of western New York. And in that report, he recommends that the British invest in improving the internal navigation of the New York colony and its frontiers. Otherwise, they would uh, lose all of, most of the lucrative fur trade and all other trade from the interior of the continent to the French up in Canada, uh, which is exactly what happened. Uh, the British did absolutely nothing to really help out the internal improvement. And the French are kind of the dominant power in North America economically for a while. That of course becomes moot about 30 years later in the Seven Years' War when the British obtain Canada 
because you know they won some battles in like India and stuff because that's how imperialism works. Um, anyway, um, so the British will eventually get all that trade, but not by improving any waterways. Um, but what would these what would these uh, internal improvements that Cadwallader Colden was looking for, what would they have been like? Uh, I'd say it's unlikely that he was advocating for anything. Well, it's definitely he was not advocating for anything nearly as grand as the Erie Canal, which would stretch all the way across the state. Uh, that would be like today if you said, I think we should build a high-tech bullet train between Montana and Wyoming. Uh, that wouldn't make sense. People don't really live there. Similarly, in upstate New York in the early 1700s, it was very sparsely populated. Um, so he may have been looking though for some smaller canals that would help navigate around obstacles like waterfalls, um, which there seems to have been a little work done by maybe private farmers maybe cut off a mile or two of bends in the Mohawk uh, during the actual time of the British. Um, and Codwellader Colden would have been well aware of canal technology, being an educated uh, Britishman. Uh, they had canals in Britain and Ireland where he was from, and they're well known. So let's look a little at early the early history of canals, just so we know what the uh, what the people making the canals knew, of, the Erie Canal knew about canals by the time Colton was around. Well, for one, canals have been in use for about 6,000 years. Uh, the Egyptians and Mesopotamians, we know were using them, though largely for irrigation. Um, we don't really start to see canals, at least in Europe, until the Middle Ages, um, when flashlock canals are created. In China, they have like their Grand Canal, which is incredibly ancient. Um, but we're not going to look at that too much because Cadwallader or Colden may have heard about that. Um, however, he would have been well aware of many of these other European canal developments. Um, so in the Middle Ages, Flashlocks canals are first created. Now, these canals operated by essentially damming up a stream until enough water built up behind the dam that you could then release the water and your boat would go flowing down the stream past the obstacle and the water level would be too high. Um, so next big, big advance happens in the 1390s when the Stecknitz Canal uh, is built. That is the first ever summit level canal. Somehow it was built with uh, flash locks because a summit level, which is what the Erie Canal is, a summit level, you have uh, different, a summit level connects two separate uh, watersheds, which means you have to at some point cross a, a hydrologic divide. So I don't know how they did that really with flash locks. They must have just found somewhere around the top of a hill-like thing that had a stream and that you could dam the stream up long enough. Uh, not that important though. Uh, the Stecknitz though, I mean, it is an incredibly important thing, uh, but we won't get into its full history. It was made largely for salt, which is also interesting uh, if you know about the Erie and where I'm at in Syracuse, Salt City, uh, beside the point. Um, the Erie would actually be a double summit canal, so this is a very important piece of technology. Um, but that advance is nothing compared, though, to the pound lock, which is going to come into existence about a hundred years later. Um, this advance, um, it, ha it occurred almost simultaneously in the Netherlands and Italy, uh, so they debate who invented it, but the Italians say Leonardo da Vinci invented it, and that's a way more fun story. Uh, here's his his sketch of a of a pound lock, and these locks allow you to move both up and down, unlike a flash lock, which obviously you could only move 
down the canal because uh, the water's flowing that way, essentially. Um, pound locks are what we commonly think of when we talk about canal locks. Uh, and indeed, 98% uh, of all locks today still are these pound locks. Uh, and that really shows how effective they are. In the 1600s, the French would make incredible strides in canal making uh, using these canal locks. Most notably, they built the Canal Royal, which is now called the Canal du Midi because, you know, French Revolution and all that. Um, and that cut from around Bordeaux all the way, so that's on the Atlantic Ocean, all the way over to the Mediterranean, um, which is very impressive. Uh, it's shorter than the Erie Canal, but it also went to higher, higher points. Um, yeah, it was at a higher elevation than the Erie. So it was a real masterpiece of engineering. Um, and then a little bit after Colden's time, um, well, after his report, he would have lived through this. That's the golden age of British canals, which began with the construction of the Bridgewater Canal in 1759 to 1761, um, which transported coal. And that's also a wonder of engineering. Um, and the British would make thousands of miles of canals. And uh, those canals would probably be the biggest influence on American canal builders. So the French ones were also very important. Um, and this is just a thing I like to add into my presentations. Um, there is a very distinct difference, I think, between European and American canals. And that is that Europeans really treated their canals almost as works of art, as well as useful things, uh, while in America, canal is really more of a utilitarian uh, ditch, if you will. So our canals are also beautiful. For instance, this is a uh, aqueduct on the Briere Canal in France, which this is why I just bring this up, because I think this is just one of the most gorgeous pieces of canal engineering there is. Um, but anyway, enough staring at this lovely aqueduct. Uh, let's move on uh, to, to some American things, not British or French or anything else. Um, like I said, the British don't really do much, even with uh, Colton's recommendations. Uh, he, interestingly, he's going to end up as the colony's provisional governor uh, for a time, but he still didn't do anything. Uh, I guess he ignored his own advice. Um, and like I said, there is some evidence of light canal work being done on the Mohawk. Uh, that's recently come to light. Uh, but really, it's not until the United States is founded that we start seeing considerable action on the canal front. In fact, uh, before the Revolutionary War ends, it's when we hear the first rumblings about waterway improvements. And those come from none other than the man often called the founder of the country, George Washington. Though if you were here earlier, you would have known um, even in 1775, guys like Ben Franklin and Charles Carroll of Carrollton were discussing the possibilities of improving New York's waterways. Uh, anyway, how did George Washington end up in New York State? Uh, the canal Builders of the canal always like to point to George Washington as kind of the impetus for the beginning of the whole canal history. Um, so uh, after, after the British were defeated at Yorktown, the only foothold the English had left in the 13 colonies was New York City. Uh, so as they were building, as they were writing the Treaty of Paris and negotiating that, uh, the Continental Army moved to Newburgh, New York on the Hudson River so they could keep an eye on the British. And that's where Washington set up his headquarters. Um, since not, was actually, not much was really going on on the front, the British st stuck around in New York City, Washington took the opportunity to take a tour of upstate New York, which at the time was the frontier of this country that he was helping to build. Uh, as a surveyor by trade, plus with a key interest in what were then known as internal improvements, 
uh, which is what they used to call transportation projects, uh, infrastructure projects, he immediately recognized that New York's geography was perfect for improvement projects, for internal improvements. In fact, he wrote a letter to his fellow Virginian, Thomas Jefferson, about New York's favorable geography. And also in that letter emphasized that they needed to get to work on improving the Potomac Valley before New York overtook Virginia in importance. We'll see that this rivalry is going to play a big role in the story going forward. Uh, an associate of Washington's, though, is going to end up taking the first real step in doing something about improving New York's waterways. And that'll be another Irishman. This, whoop, sorry. Uh, Christopher Coles, a man considered by many to be a visionary before his times. In a lot of ways, he has ideas for how to get water to New York City and all that, but we're looking at his canal stuff. Um, in 1784, Coles went to the New York legislature with a proposal to improve the existing Mohawk River route, a series of canals and locks to overcome the larger obstacles. Um, and they authorized a few hundred dollars for him uh, to pursue this on November 3rd, 1784. However, the money they allocated was not nearly sufficient. And Coles' project went absolutely nowhere even when more money was authorized by the state in the supply bill of 1785. Again, these funds were not nearly sufficient uh, as they were only around $1,000. Uh, the engineering just wasn't there at the time either. Uh, Washington re-enters our story though in 1785 uh, when he's chilling at Mount Vernon, enjoying his retirement when an interesting guest arrived. This fellow, Elkanah Watson, an enterprising patriot who, whose life uh, took him all over the world. One of his friends was Benjamin Franklin, um, and Washington was apparently one of his friends, so not that good of a friend, because uh, Washington did not love that Watson had kind of shown up at his house unannounced, but he humored Watson, and they discussed their mutual interests including internal improvements. And apparently the talk turned to New York's ideal geography for such projects. Watson was intrigued and following a failed business venture in North Carolina, he moved up to Albany where he began working on convincing the state to let him work on improving the Mohawk. Thus, on March 24th, 1791, the New York State Legislature agreed to pay for surveying work on the Mohawk. These surveys would result in the establishment of the first real physical attempt to improve New York's water navigation. That's right, folks. We have finally reached the point where we're talking about canal building-ish. Uh, and that thing is the Western Inland Lock and Navigation Company which is founded a year after uh, those surveys come in, in 1795. Uh, as the name indicates, this was a private corporation and many prominent New Yorkers bought shares, including uh, one purchased by a young DeWitt Clinton. Um, however, he's not that important uh, at this point in the story, foreshadowing here, DeWitt Clinton will become very important in this story, uh, but right now he just owns one stock in this company. Everybody kind of bought stock in it in New York. They thought maybe it'll succeed, maybe it'll fail. The stocks aren't that expensive. Um, rich people in New York. Uh, anyway, notably though, the chief investor in the project, uh, he would become company pres president, was another notable New Yorker, Philip Schuyler who you may know as Alexander Hamilton's father-in-law. Uh, Schuyler would turn out to be a driving force in the early years of the project, overseeing the construction of locks around Little Falls. And he was given that responsibility because while there were no trained engineers in America at this point, uh, Schuyler had at least been to England and he had seen real canals in operation. 
which in the early days of America, especially out here on the frontiers in upstate New York, that's, that's something to have actually seen a canal. Um, still though, while he was able to build a lock, uh, his engineering abilities still weren't quite up to snuff to try some of the more complicated things the company wanted to do. Plus, by the, night, by the 1790s, he was getting pretty old. So they hired a British engineer, William Weston, who worked on many of the nation's earliest canal projects, uh, which all generally met with mixed success, but Weston already got, always got some pretty decent paychecks out of the, out of the deal. Um, Weston worked on the um, Western Inland for several years, helping with the construction of some small canals, including one that connected the Mohawk and Wood Creek, uh, as well as dams, which could help regulate the supply of water to Wood Creek. Uh, but really, these didn't amount to much, and ultimately, the Western Inland was a failure. The technology wasn't advanced enough, funding was consistently a problem, and the idea of simply improving the Mohawk in bits and pieces was totally impractical at the time. Uh, the river was far too wild, and in practically every spring melt uh, and the ensuing flood, uh, the previous year's improvements were washed away. That said, though, there were some positives to the project. Shipping costs were reduced greatly, and New York gained some experience in the field of internal improvements. A notable assistant of Weston's was Benjamin Wright of Rome, who would go on to become the Erie Canal's chief engineer. Okay, let's see, we've got something going on in the chat. Ah. Yes, I would suggest people check out uh, Dana Stimson shared in the chat a uh, book by Charles Carroll of Carrollton, which sounds like a very interesting read. Um, anywho, um, so that brings us up to about 1800, uh, the end of the 18th century. So let's take a quick, quick look at America as it entered into its first full century existence in the 1800s, because really to understand how the Erie Canal came to be, we have to understand that it was grounded in the context of its time. All right, uh, so for one, Americans were beginning to move west with more frequency. Um, Revolutionary War soldiers were rewarded with free tracts of land on the frontier, and New England especially was becoming very overcrowded. So poor New Englanders uh, started moving west looking for new lands to settle and farm. And uh, overall, Americans were really just hoping to take advantage of the vast resources offered by the West, especially following the Louisiana Purchase. Many of these Americans who moved west across the Appala Appalachians to the Great Lakes Basin found that it was easier and more profitable to ship their goods up the St. Lawrence to Montreal, thus depriving American merchants and ports of valuable trade and also benefiting British-owned Canada. Uh, this loss of trade is part of a larger rift in the early United States between the East and the West uh, that looked like it might divide the nation in half along the Appalachians. Uh, Jefferson even confided at one point that he thought the nation the nation would split in two. And uh, the danger of this was highlighted in the winter of 1805-1806 when a conspiracy led by Aaron Burr was uncovered that planned to form a new nation somewhere in the West. Uh, that was stopped quickly, but fun fact, uh, one of the original settlers of Syracuse was heavily involved in that conspiracy. Uh, anywho, uh, all this Oh, and also that guy would build the second ever canal boat. Uh, but anyway, uh, all this was happening with the backdrop of Jeffersonian democracy, which emphasized individualism, a decentralized government, and westward expansion. It held up the yeoman farmer as an ideal citizen. Uh, also, on a global level, the Napoleonic Wars were happening, which resulted in a greater volume of trade for the neutral United States. 
uh, as there was a huge demand for American agricultural products since places like France and Germany were being ravaged by war uh, and also you needed to feed your armies. Uh, so it was during this time when Thomas Jefferson's treasury secretary, the Swiss immigrant, Albert Gallatin, took the next major step in the story of the canal. In 1807, he put forward what is creatively now called the Gallatin Plan, calling for a comprehensive national plan for infrastructure improvements, with one of the most notable projects being the construction of two canals. Uh, one that would connect New York to the Great Lakes, uh, well, to Lake Ontario, and another bypassing Niagara Falls here. Um, and this report caused a ton of excitement all over the country, especially in areas that would benefit from these improvements. And you can see where all these proposed improvements were. A lot of places would benefit, though people thought New York would benefit a lot from these canals. Um, and these would be very expensive to build. Um, but anyway, we're, I'm getting a little ahead of ourselves. Um, so these regions really work to try to make these plans a reality, thinking that the federal government, since they just proposed this, would support them in these efforts. So that finally brings us to the government of New York. Uh, well, yeah, New York in 1807, uh, right after this report is, is written. 1807, in a Canandaigua jail cell, this man, Jesse Holly, who is a failed flour merchant uh, who had been in prison for debt, uh, he read the report, and inspired by that, he examined maps of New York and came to the conclusion that Gallatin was wrong uh, and that it would be best to make a grand canal all the way across the state from Lake Erie to the Hudson. And he wrote about these plans and even traced out a proposed route for this canal in a series of letters to the Genesee Messenger using the alias Hercules in order to keep his identity secret since being in prison he thought would discredit his whole everything he was saying. Um, and these letters would serve as an inspiration for many of the canal's biggest promoters going forward and the canal would ultimately follow a course very similar to the one laid out by Hawley, uh, despite his complete lack of training in engineering and surveying. Uh, also in 1807, a fusion ticket emerged in upstate New York known as the Canal Ticket, where Democratic Republicans and Federalists put aside their differences for the common goal of getting a canal built. Uh, leading this push was Joshua Foreman, often considered the founder of Syracuse, uh, and this ticket overwhelmingly won the Western District, which is what a large swath of upstate New York was called. And on February 4th, 1808, Foreman, seconded by Rome's Benjamin Wright, who we've already met in this story, uh, introduced a bill to survey the best route for a canal, which was approved on April 11th appropriating $600 for a survey, which was, was done. Uh, and then the next year in 1809, that was when Joshua Foreman went to Washington. Because again, remember, Gallatin Report comes out, they get this survey done, shows a potential route. So Foreman's gonna go down to Washington to try to get federal funding for this canal. And uh, while he's there, he meets with President Jefferson, who I would like to remind everybody right now is a Virginian. And this is what Thomas Jefferson, who allegedly is a supporter of internal improvement, says to Foreman, a fine project and might be executed a century hence. Why, sir, here is a canal of a few miles. He's referring to the Potomac Canal, uh, projected by General Washington, which, if completed, would render this a fine commercial city, which has languished for many years because the small sum of $200,000 necessary to complete it 
cannot be obtained by the federal government, the state government, or from individuals. And you talk of making a canal of 350 miles through the wilderness. It is little short of madness to think of it at this day. And this is a very famous quote on the Erie Canal, uh, especially the little short of madness bit. Um, but uh, as you can tell, the federal government did not fund a canal project in 1810, uh, in 1809. Uh, so that kind of kills the whole canal thing for a little while. Uh, it's revived though, the next year, uh, when this fella comes around. Uh, this is when the canal project really starts to pick up steam. Uh, this is, at the time, State Senator Jonas Platt, whose father, Zephaniah, is the namesake of Plattsburgh, just a fun little fact. Uh, he ran for governor as a Federalist candidate in 1810. Now, Platt knew he had a tough road ahead of him in the 1810 election, largely because he was the first Federalist who even dared to run for the governorship in a decade. And he was facing the incredibly popular Democratic Republican, Daniel D. Tompkins, uh, who we're going to hear a lot from in the rest of this story. Uh, Platt recognized it was going to be a difficult race and he needed a platform that could excite the populace of New York and hopefully get them to vote for him. Um, Looking for this political launching pad, Platt enlisted the help of his friend and federal federalist, fellow federalist, Thomas Eddy, who also happened to be the treasurer of the Western Inland Lock and Navigation Company, which was still limping around in 1810. Uh, they both agreed that the most compelling issue they could run on would be a canal platform, inspired by the Gallatin Report and the Hercules Letters. Uh, though, because of the weak position that the Federalists held in the state, they needed to make their project look like it had bipartisan support. So to do this, on March 12th, 1810, Platt and Eddy approached a man who was the most powerful Democratic Republican in the state and who would ultimately, his name would be most associated with the Erie Canal, and that was DeWitt Clinton. Yes, he's finally really arrived in the story. Um, they enlist him. So let's talk a little about DeWitt Clinton, because to talk about the Erie Canal and its foundation, you need to talk about him a little. Uh, he was born March 2nd, 1769, into the powerful Clinton family. His father, James, was a Revolutionary War general who, along with John Sullivan, led the 1779 campaign uh, through upstate New York, which decimated much of the Haudenosaunee population in this area, uh, while his uncle George was the state's first governor for about 20, the first 20 or 30 years of the state's existence. John Jay was in there for like two years. Uh, so. George is an important guy, and in 1810, uh, George Clinton, not the founder of Parliament Funkadelic, um, different George Clinton, he uh, was the vice president of uh, the United States at the time. But anyway, back to, uh, back to Clinton. Uh, after graduating from Columbia in the first ever class that graduated from Columbia University, not King's College, uh, Clinton used his family connections to win a seat in the New York State Assembly in 1798, where he quickly became an important figure in New York politics. Uh, he briefly served as one of the state's two U.S. senators, but resigned after only a year in office. As a result of this, his uncle uh, appointed him to the first of his three terms as New York City's mayor, uh, which was not an elected position at the time, the governor appointed mayors to New York City. Uh, and from that point on, he would become New York's kingmaker for a time, even serving as a mentor to Daniel D. Tompkins, who would soon become one of his greatest enemies. Um, yeah. So there you have it. This is who Platt and Eddie recruit to help in their canal scheme. So let's see what they did with this new alliance. Um, on March 13th, Platt proposed a resolution 
uh, to examine routes between the Hudson and the Great Lakes. Extended by Clinton. Um, due to Clinton's support, it was widely accepted and the New York State Legislature established a bipartisan canal commission consisting of some of the foremost men in the state to oversee the project. Uh, chairing the commission was Governor Morris, famous for penning the preamble to the Constitution. He was joined by the richest man in the United States at the time, Stephen Van Rensselaer, uh, as well as William North, the Baron von Steuben's former aide-de-camp, uh, the longtime state surveyor, Simeon DeWitt, who was also Clinton's cousin, uh, and future Secretary of War, Peter Beal Porter. And rounding it out would be Thomas Eddy and DeWitt Clinton. Uh, this illustrious group decided that in order to do their job properly, they need to examine the route that this proposed canal might take. So they embarked on one of the most legendary fact-finding missions of all time, uh, the Commissioner's Tour of 1810. This tour started on July 2nd and took the commissioners all the way across the state. Now, here's just a fun little story from that tour. While the commissioners were uh, subjected to living that they certainly would not have been accustomed to as the upper class of New York State's pretty much aristocracy at the time. Uh, they didn't let, let being in the middle of nowhere uh, keep them from the finer things in life. Legend has it that they, that they were able to avoid contracting malaria in the Montezuma swamps, uh, as many workers would while digging the canal. Uh, because of the thick cloud of cigar smoke that constantly surrounded them uh, as they moved along. Uh, but anyway, what happened to Jonas Platt, uh, you ask? Well, he got destroyed by Daniel D. Tompkins in the general election, uh, but things worked out well for the canal, though. Uh, so that brings us to 1811. Um, it took the rest of the year in 1810 to compare notes and all that, and they had Governor Morris write up a canal commissioner's report for 1811. Uh, this report was a seminal moment in the history of the canal as it laid out a plan that would influence the project heavily going forward. Um, so it's written by Morris and for one, it recommended a route all the way to Lake Erie rather than the two canals proposed by Gallatin, the one connecting Ontario and the Hudson and the other circumventing, circumventing Niagara Falls between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. Uh, the reason for this recommendation was that the added time and money required to use the two canals um, would make it so ultimately most of the trade would go to Montreal uh, rather than down this proposed Ontario canal. And it would also make New York more vulnerable to attack from Canada. The only commissioner to oppose this was Peter Buell Porter who owned the portage rights around Niagara Falls. Um, so he kind of wanted to, to keep this two canal system because uh, Lake Erie route would make his very lucrative uh, good carrying business, it would put it out of business. Um, and the Niagara Canal would end up being built on his property if it was built. Spoiler alert, that one's not going to be built, at least by Americans. Um, but anyway, a more contentious uh, point, though, in the report was what form the canal would take. Governor Morris firmly believed the canal should be an inclined plane fed entirely from its highest point, Lake Erie. Almost every other commissioner, though, believed it should be a lock and level canal, uh, which all the commissioners believed it and the engineers they consulted also said it would make much more sense. Uh, it would be very impractical to build an inclined plane. Uh, for instance, over Schoharie Creek, you would have to build a 150 foot high berm to support the canal. And that's just one of many very impractical things. Uh, but nonetheless, since Morris was the commission's president in writing the report, uh, the inclined plane idea was the one submitted to the legislature on March 2nd. Uh, enemies of the canal would pick up on this point and use it to illustrate the impracticality of the project, even after the commissioners had begun recommending the lock and level canal. 
Uh, with this report, though, and the relatively positive outlook of its content, state passed another act on April 8th, uh, authorizing the commissioners to uh, look for, for funds. They also added Robert Livingston and Robert Fulton to the commission. Uh, these two would do practically nothing for the canal. They were just really notable names who had been involved in building the first steamship. They're going to die, both of them, within the next year or two. Um, also in April, Clinton was appointed the lieutenant governor. Good for him. He's in an even more powerful spot. Um, and then the actual work started. Uh, two men, James Geddes and Benjamin Wright, were hired to survey the route. Uh, and these guys are incredibly important in the history of the Erie Canal. They're both going to end up as uh, chief engineers uh, on the canal project. Um, however, the legislature had only authorized funding to a route to Lake Ontario. Um, luckily, someone was from the Canal Commission was able to talk James Geddes into going all the way to Lake Erie uh, on his own dime. He would be paid back for that later in history, but at the time they just talked James Geddes into surveying this western route all the way. Uh, and in the end, they come back and they recommend a lock canal and Morris finally agrees to do that in the next year's report. Uh, but he is also going to resign from the Canal Commission as well. Uh, not before, though, uh, he and DeWitt Clinton would head on down to Washington on December 21st to meet the new president, another Virginian, James Madison. Uh, and on December 24th, Madison even delivered a favorable speech to Congress, talking about how great internal improvements were, how good this New York State Canal would be. Uh, but then on <laughs> January 10th, they reject that bill. Well, um, January 10th, 1812. So they reject the land bill. Um, then, those of you who might have rec saw the year there, 1812, America's going to end up in a war. Uh, War of 1812, which is going to, to put the canal on a bit of a back burner for a while, and it'll almost kill the canal. It will also prove the reason why the canal is built, uh, largely because the war is hindered by poor transportation, especially to the New York frontier. Um, but, so, physically, the need for a canal is more apparent than ever. Uh, however, politically, the canal is going to take quite the hit. 1812, uh, DeWitt Clinton will run for president uh, on a peace ticket. He appeals to Federalists as well as peaceful Democratic Republicans. He almost wins presidency, but uh, Pennsylvania barely goes to James Madison. So DeWitt Clinton is not our fifth president. On April 15th, 1814, Governor Tompkins has the Canal Act rescinded. Uh, and on October 14th, Governor Tompkins takes away Clinton's mayorship. Um, so this is really the lowest point in DeWitt Clinton's life, probably. Uh, this is the first time in the entire 1800s he doesn't have a, a government position other than being a canal commissioner. And apparently uh, he retreated back to his Long Island estate where he supposedly drowned his sorrows for a time. However, Clinton's wallowing in self-pity and uh, copious amounts of alcohol uh, would not last for too long uh, as the end of the war, especially the stunning victory at New Orleans, sparked a new wave of nationalism and a desire to improve uh, the country, known as the era of good feelings. And this wave of patriotism would ultimately prove the spark that would get the project started. Uh, but a few hurdles had to be crossed first. I see I'm going a bit over my time. So try to run through this a bit faster than other times. Uh, so the war ends beginning of 1815. Uh, Clinton's holed up in Long Island, but eventually Tom comes on down there 
and uh, he talks Clinton after probably a few strong cups of coffee into coming out of, of retirement, if you will, uh, to go on a big speaking tour of all of New York, uh, talking up this canal. And on December 3rd, 1815, he delivers a speech at the City Hotel, very well organized. Uh, they pack the room with canal supporters who just go nuts for this speech that Clinton uh, delivers. Conveniently, there happens to be like a gigantic petition, which they, you know, supposedly spontaneously threw together. They didn't, Clinton had this prepared, uh, but they write it, this petition, it gets signed by thousands of, um, of New Yorkers. However, while the common folk are big fans of the Canal Project, uh, it's going to really meet its big villains, uh, if you will, uh, the people who are going to fight the Canal the most. That is Daniel D. Tompkins right here, um, Clinton's former protege, and a young lawyer, now state senator at this point, from Kinderhook, Martin Van Buren, are all going to be heavily involved in the fight against the canal. They fight against it, and they create this kind of toothless act in 1816. Uh, Van Buren is one of the greatest politicians of all time, possibly, and uh, he has a real knack for reading what people wanted in at this time. Uh, so he makes this kind of worthless 1816 act, uh, just to kind of gauge how New Yorkers, if they will continue to want a canal, or if this was just like, 1816, New Yorkers got real crazy over this canal, but it doesn't have any long-lasting support. Um, so the canal people aren't able to do much with that. They can't dig. They are getting almost no funding for the canal. Uh, but the next year, a few things are going to happen. Uh, in 1817, on February 24th, Daniel D. Tompkins is going to resign the presidency, I mean the governorship, to become vice president of the United States for the new president, James Monroe. Um, you would think that would be kind of a bad thing for the Erie Canal. Uh, Daniel D. Tompkins just got raised to what is technically the second most powerful job in the country, um, but really by this point the canal is clearly just a New York fight. Um, so it takes Daniel D. Tompkins out of New York politics. Uh, on March 3rd, James Madison is going to veto the bonus bill, which was proposed by John C. Calhoun. Yes, that John C. Calhoun. Um, he's going to propose the sweeping um, series of projects that will be funded by the National Bank and uh, the interest from the National Bank. Um, to build internal improvements all over the country. Madison will veto that. He cites a very strict interpretation of the Constitution, which I guess if you wrote the Constitution, you can make whatever arguments you want about it. Um, and then, uh, so that, that bill totally kills the prospect of federal funding. So on March 19th, an act to build and finance the canal between Rome and the Seneca River is presented to the New York State Assembly, which is going to be really important. They debate it for about a month, and on April 10th, the bill passes the Assembly. The Senate sits on that for a, while, on a, for a few days, till April 15th, well, really April 14th. It's finally read to the Senate. Um, yeah, then, the next day, they start working on it. So April 15th. Uh, and April 15th is the last day of the legislative session in Albany. So at 10 a.m., after a whole night of thinking about the bill, the Senate sends an amended bill back to the Assembly. Uh, it talks a lot about what to do with the Western Inland Lock and Navigation Company. They change a few other things up. Uh, an hour and a half later, the assembly has looked at the bill, 
They've been like, okay, not not a bad bill. Send it back to the Senate where it is read at 1120. Uh, evidently, at some point in there, um, I believe it's in here, senators were like, oh, actually, we don't fully agree with what we said about the Western Inland Lock and Navigation Company. They want to change it. A short debate occurs. Josiah Ogden uh, proposes sending the bill to committee, which will kill it. The legislative session ends at noon. A committee can't even decide when to meet within 15 minutes. Uh, so a committee would totally kill it. Uh, but everyone's like, sit down, Josiah. That's a dumb idea. And his, uh, his motion is handily defeated. Um, but the Senate approves uh, the, the state assembly's amendments and they return the bill to the assembly. Then the assembly, okay, so I got the whole Western Inland thing wrong uh, a little. Uh, the assembly is the one who rejects the senator's buyout of the Western Inland Lock and Navigation Company with 15 minutes to go. It looks like this canal bill is dead uh, and it comes back to the Senate to vote on again if they are willing to accept the assembly's new rejection of the buyout of the Western Inland Lock and Navigation Company. Everyone thinks it's done for. And uh, if it dies in 1817, the bill, they're not going to propose it three years in a row for it to do nothing. Uh, no politician in the right mind could be like, let me just keep supporting this, this thing that's not working. But then Martin Van Buren delivers a short but impassioned pro-canal speech. Apparently he'd read the room and figured he could use the canal to do some, some good political wrangling of his own, which he will. Uh, remember, this is going to create tons of state jobs, and uh, Martin Van Buren is going to use that to its full effect. Uh, so Van Buren delivers this speech, and a vote is quickly called. And the bill passes the Senate 13 to 12. Um, so yay, the canal bill has passed. Uh, notably, not a single assemblyman or senator from the New York City area, which would ultimately benefit the most from the Erie Canal, voted in favor of the bill. Um, and nowadays, the bill would be good to go, other than have to go to the governor who could veto it, conceivably. But this is not nowadays. There was a third thing that laws had to go through in New York, which was something called the Council of Revision. Uh, which looked at every single law. Um, its members were Jonas Platt, who we've already, already talked about, Joseph Yates, who was also a pro-canal uh, person, and then there was also James Kent and Smith Thompson, who were notably against the canal. Everyone knew those guys are against the canal, right? Uh, so, all, there was going to be a tie, and all ties would be broken by the governor. With the time, it's the interim governor, John Taylor, who was the political protege of Daniel D. Tompkins. So everybody knew John Taylor would kill this canal, and the, the canal would not happen. But then, lucky for us, this guy was on the Council of Revision. You see, Governor, former governor, now Vice President Thompson, Tompkins, was still in Albany. He hadn't gone down to Washington yet to take on his vice presidential duties. So he rushes in to the Council of Revision room and tells them, like, you need to vote against this law because we need to save up our money here in New York State to build fortifications and ships and everything else for the next war that's going to happen with England. Uh, he thinks it's inevitable. We're going to end up in a war again with Britain. That the, the Treaty of Ghent, which ends the War of 1812, is just a temporary truce. Well, did you know that this fella, James Kent, we talked a little about how he was kind of on the anti-canal side. Um, he was even more, though, anti-war. His son had died in the War of 1812. Uh, and because of that, he was he hated war. 
So he delivers what I think is one of the greatest uh, lines in really the history of American politics, really morally, it was quite noble, I think. Uh, he says, if we are to have war or to have a canal, I am in favor of the canal and I vote for the bill. Um, so he votes for it. John Taylor doesn't get to cast his tie-breaking vote. The canal law passes 3-1 in the Council of Revision. Uh, so it's, it's all up downhill for the canal after that. Uh, in April, the canal commissioners start to make their first decisions um, on what to do about the canal, where exactly the route will be. On May 7th, they hired James Geddes and Benjamin Wright uh, as chief engineers, Wright to do the Erie, Geddes to do the Champlain Canal, also built at the same time. In May, DeWitt Clinton runs for governor, pretty much unopposed. Um, Peter Buell Porter puts up some minor resistance, uh, but Clinton wins 98% of the vote, I believe, which is still a record for largest landslide by a governor, because everyone's super excited about this canal. He wins, like, everyone's like, okay, Clinton got this incredible canal to start being built. He should be governor. Um, and on June 27th, John Seymour of Rome is given the first ever contract to build to start digging the canal. It's unlikely he really did anything until after July 4th, when Judge John Richardson, this is a fanciful picture of what would happen. July 4th, 1817, Judge John Richardson will dig the first shovelful of dirt for the Erie Canal outside of Fort Bull in Rome. Um, and the rest, as they say, is history. But the name of this talk was the conception of the canal, not the building of the canal. So there we go. It has been conceived, the canal, if you will. Um, so there we go.